Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So, good afternoon, and uh, well, it's afternoon because it's a quarter past noon, so it's afternoon, and welcome to this new event of the Microsoft Research Talk series. My name is Francesco Logozzo, I'm a researcher at Microsoft Research, and today I'm extremely thrilled, I don't know if it is proper English to say extremely thrilled, but it gives my, my state of mind, of introducing Professor Richard Dawkins, <laughs> and uh, well, to welcome it, uh, him at Microsoft Research. So Richard Dawkins is the most famous living evolutionary biologist and the most famous atheist. According to a poll of the Prospectus magazine, done among more than 10,000 subscribers in more than 100 countries, he is considered as the number one world thinker. He's a fellow of the New College in Oxford, which if you, if you wonder, the New College was new in the 14th century, if I'm not wrong, but well, that's, that's still a new college. And he is a fellow of both the Royal Society and the Royal Society of Literature, so wow. He published more than 11 books in subject on uh, science and religion, and uh, <coughs> all these books are still on print and, and I guess also on, on Kindle. His most famous book is The Selfish Gene, which was published in 1976. And uh, this book recently uh, has been um, defined by someone who likes red shoes, which is not me, <laughs> and uh, used to be infallible as a, as a classical example of science fiction. So I, I don't know if you read <laughs> if you read the Italian newspaper, but this guy was, uh, uh, was the Pope Emeritus, Joseph Ratzinger, say, you know, not nice thing about the selfish scene. So the nice thing is, or at least what uh, the funny thing, the coincidence is that in the very first line of the selfish scene in the introduction in the 1976 uh, edition, it says, you say, this book should, not, should be read almost as though it were science fiction. It is designed to appeal to imagination, but it's not science fiction, it's science. So it seems that you already answered. 37 years in advance. I have the gift of prophecy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. So what this book is, so please correct me if I'm wrong, I'm just a computer scientist, not a biologist, even if I married one, a etologist, is that this book, you revolutionized uh, evolution theory by showing that natural selection is a matter of genes only doing what is best for the own survival. It's okay, it's okay. rather than uh, what is <laughs> so best sorry. for the survival in the species. I do beg your pardon, I'm so yeah, sorry. Yeah. Oh no, you take, so in particular when I say the only thing about biology, so you, you cannot correct if I say something stupid. <laughs> well, biology nowadays is a branch of computer science anyway. Oh yes, everything <laughs> is computer science. <laughs> so well, in, in a way it's, a, it's not a surprise that uh, Joseph Ratzinger didn't like the, uh, the selfish gene because uh, you, Richard Dawkins who is also the author of The God Delusion, the bestseller book, and in which he applies the rigors of a scientific method to theology. And uh, if you haven't read the book, well, you can imagine the output. So today, Richard Dawkins is here to present his uh, last book, the book of memoir. And uh, I really enjoyed reading it. In particular, I discovered things about Richard Dawkins I didn't, I didn't know. So this one really, really shocked me. So there is this quote from uh, John Maynard Smith who says, while writing The Selfish Gene, Richard Dawkins was recovering from a, a severe addiction to computer programming. <laughs> I'm so sad. <laughs> it's not a joke. We are in Microsoft. We love computer programming. We, we, you know, we are all addicted. So what, what is this tragic event of, you know, it's the recovery event, not the addiction, of, of course. And so I also discovered that you designed two programming languages, and we love programming languages, particularly in my research group for PDP-8. Yeah, so something I would like to know, to know is why the love affair with computer programming is happily over. What happened? <laughs> okay. So thank you very much again thank for you. coming. And, and yes, my knowledge of <laughs> my knowledge of programming languages is now out of the ark. I, I'm I'm a prehistoric dinosaur of, of computing. I'm actually quite lucky to have got here because um, somebody rebooked my air ticket to 
Seattle under the name of Richard Dawkins. And you might think that's a perfectly sensible name to book it under since that is my name. However, let me read you the first page of my memoir. Glad to know you, Clint. The friendly passport controller was not to know that British people are sometimes given a family name first, followed by the name their parents wanted them to use. I was always to be Richard, just as my father was always John. Our first name of Clinton was something we forgot about, as our parents had intended. To me, it has been no more than a niggling irritation, which I would have been happier without, notwithstanding the serendipitous realisation that it gives me the same initials as Charles Robert Darwin. But alas, nobody anticipated the United States Department of Homeland Security. <laughs> Not content with scanning our shoes and rationing our toothpaste, this keystone copsworthy institution decreed that anyone entering America must travel under his first name, exactly as written in his passport. So I had to forego my lifelong identity as Richard and rebrand myself Clinton R. Dawkins when booking tickets to the States and, of course, when filling in those important forms, the ones that require you explicitly to deny that you're entering the USA in order to overthrow the Constitution by force of arms. <laughs> sole purpose of visit was the British broadcaster Gilbert Harding's response to that. Nowadays such levity will see you banged up. This first chapter is just a bit of fun to introduce some of my ancestors going back to the 18th century and I just want to mention now Clinton George Augustus Dawkins 1808 to 71 who was one of few Dawkinses actually to use the name Clinton. If he inherited any of his father's ardour, that's a reference to his father who eloped with Augusta, the daughter of General Sir Henry Clinton, who was mostly responsible for losing the American War of Independence. Uh, General Clinton um, was so annoyed at this elopement um, that Henry Dawkins had to uh, resort to stationing a hansom cab at all four corners of the square where General Clinton lived, uh, only one of which he and Miss Clinton were in. Uh, and um, with the hansom cabs had, had instructions to drive off in opposite directions, so the general didn't know which one to pursue. So as I said, if their son, Clinton George Augustus, inherited any of his father's ardour, he nearly lost it in 1849 during an Austrian bombardment of Venice, where he was the British consul. I have a cannonball in my possession, sitting on a plinth, bearing an inscription on a brass plate. I don't know whose is the authorial voice, and I don't know how reliable it is, but for what it's worth, here is my translation from French, then the language of diplomacy. One night, when he was in bed, a cannonball penetrated the bedclothes and passed between his legs, but happily did him no more than superficial damage. <laughs> this narrow escape of my ancestor's vital parts <laughs> took place before he was to put them to use, and it is tempting to attribute my own existence to a stroke of ballistic luck. A few inches closer to the fork of Shakespeare's radish and... <laughs> But actually, my existence and yours and the postman's hangs from a far narrower thread of luck than that. We owe it to the precise timing and placing of everything that ever happened since the universe began. The incident of the cannonball is only a dramatic example of a much more general phenomenon. As I put it before, if the second dinosaur to the left of the tall cycad tree had not happened to sneeze, and thereby fail to catch the tiny, shrew-like ancestor of all the mammals, we would none of us be here. We all can regard ourselves as exquisitely improbable. But here, in a triumph of hindsight, we are. CGA Cannonball, Dawkins' son, Clinton, later Sir Clinton, Edward Dawkins, 1859 to 1905, was one of many Dawkinses to attend Balliol College, Oxford, as I was 
myself later to do. He was there at the right time to be immortalized in the Balliol Rhymes. In the spring term of 1881, seven undergraduates composed and printed scurrilous rhymes about personalities of the college. Most famous is the verse that celebrates Balliol's great master, Benjamin Jowett, composed by H.C. Beeching, later Dean of Norwich Cathedral. First come I, my name is Jowett. There's no knowledge, but I know it. I am master of this college. What I don't know isn't knowledge. Less witty but intriguing to me is the rhyme on Clinton Edward Dawkins. Positivists ever talk in such an epic style as Dawkins. God is naught and man is all. Spell him with a capital. Freethinkers were much less common in Victorian times, and I wish I had met great-great-uncle Clinton. And what should we make of that epic style? Well, I go on in the book to my own life, my own early childhood in Africa, my own early school days in Africa. I was sent away to boarding school in what was then southern Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, at the rather early age of seven, uh, it's too early, really, to send a child away to boarding school, I suppose, nowadays we would say. Um, and an indication of that is, as I record in the book, I used to fantasise that the matron, Miss Copleston, known as Coppers, to her face, uh, I used to fantasise that she would turn into my mother. And since they both had black curly hair, I thought it wouldn't take too great a miracle to achieve it. We then, I'd only been there for two terms when the family left Africa and returned to England because my father was left in the will of a very distant cousin. Uh, the family estate, I suppose you could call it, had been in the family since 1723 uh, and Henry Dawkins. And um, so we went to England and I was sent to another school, another boarding school in England. And I'm just going to read from my first, my early school report from that school. I was an exceptionally untidy and disorganised little boy in my early years at Chaffing Grove School. My first school reports dwelt insistently on the theme of ink. Headmaster's report. He has produced some good work and well deserves his prize. A very inky little boy at present, which is apt to spoil his work. Latin. He has made steady progress, but unfortunately, when using ink, his written work becomes very untidy. <laughs> Mathematics. He works very well, but I'm not always able to read his work. <laughs> he must learn that ink is for writing, not washing purposes. <laughs> Miss Benson, my elderly French teacher, somehow managed to omit the ink light motif but even her report had a sting in the tail. French, plenty of ability, a good pronunciation, and a wonderful facility in escaping work. <laughs> I then went on to um, a more advanced school, Oundle School, at the age of 13, uh, where, again, it was a boys' boarding school. There were no girls, which kind of meant, made for a slightly odd atmosphere. Uh, not entirely surprisingly, one of my friends took up with one of the housemaids, and I'll tell that story in a moment. Um, Oundle was where I gave up such religious belief as I had, and actually became rather rebellious, and I and two friends would sit bolt upright, with our arms folded, looking defiant, uh, while the rest of the, of the chapel was, had bowed heads like that. We were kind of islands of rebellion in this sea of reverence all around us. Um, because it was an Anglican school, they were all very decent about it, and we never got into trouble about that. But I lately learned from my mother that my housemaster, Mr Peter Ling, did actually summon my parents for a heart-to-heart -heart talk over tea about my rebellious behaviour in chapel. I knew nothing of this at the time, and my mother has only just told me of the incident. Mr Ling asked my parents to try to persuade me to change my ways. My father said, approximately by my mother's recollection, 
It is not our business to control him in that sort of way. That kind of thing is your problem. <laughs> and I'm afraid I must decline your request. My parents' attitude to the whole affair was that it wasn't important. Mr Ling was, in his way, a decent man. A contemporary and friend of mine in the same house recently told me the following nice story. He was illicitly up in a dormitory during the day, kissing one of the housemaids. The pair panicked when they heard a heavy tread on the stairs, and my friend hastily bundled the young woman up onto a windowsill and drew the curtains to hide her standing form. Mr Ling came into the room and must have noticed that only one of the three windows had the curtains drawn. Even worse, my friend noticed to his horror that the girl's feet were clearly visible protruding under the curtain. He firmly believed that Mr Ling must have realised what was going on, but pretended not to, perhaps on boys will be boys grounds. What are you doing up in the dormitory at this hour? Just came up to change my socks, sir. Oh well, hurry on down. Good call on Mr Ling's part. That boy went on to become probably the most successful alumnus of his generation, the knighted chief executive officer of one of the largest international corporations on, in the world and a generous benefactor of the school, endowing, among other things, the Peter Ling Fellowship. That was uh, Sir Howard Stringer, who went on to become CEO of the Sony Corporation, um, the only non-Japanese to have held that office. I think he's now chairman of the board. I then went on to Oxford, which I think could fairly be said to be the making of me. Um, I learned there to give up school ways, which I regard as mugging up from textbooks a lot of facts, and to switch instead to the university way of being educated, which I think is really to be a scholar. And uh, to go into the library and read original research papers and become kind of a world authority on a very narrow subject, one subject at a time, assigned me by the one-to-one -one, uh, tutor. We had a one-to-one -one tutorial system at Oxford, and the tutor would send you into the library with a reading list from original research papers, which is a very different kind of education. And um, f from there, I did, went on to do a, a, a PhD. It's called D. Phil at Oxford under Nico Tinbergen, a famous um, animal behaviourist ethologist, and then went on to be a very junior assistant professor at Berkeley, California, for two years in the late 60s, which was the sort of height of the drugs and flower power time, um, demonstrations against the Vietnam War, and so on. There's a little incident which I'd like to read to you, because uh, it's rather surprising for the flower power generation, a little anecdote of something that I noticed in Berkeley. I was walking along Telegraph Avenue, axis of Berkeley's beads, incense and marijuana culture. A young man was walking ahead of me, dressed in the insignia of the flower power generation. Every time a young woman passed him, walking in the opposite direction, he would reach out and tweak one of her breasts. Far from slapping him or crying harassment, she would simply walk on by as if nothing had happened, and he would proceed to the next one. Today I find this almost impossible to believe, but it is a very secure memory. His demeanour did not appear especially lascivious, and his action was evidently not taken by the young women as the gesture of a male chauvinist pig. It seemed all of a piece with hippiedom, with the laid-back peace-and-love atmosphere of 60s San Francisco. I'm very glad to say that things have changed. Today's counterparts in age and class of that young man and the young women he molested, as we should now say, would be among the, those most strongly outraged at behaviour which was then the norm for that age, class and political persuasion. I had never been to America before, and I did find some things bewildering. At my first meeting of the zoology faculty, Everyone spoke almost entirely in numbers. Who's doing 314? No, I'm doing 246. Nowadays, the English-speaking world knows that exology 101 means, somewhat patronisingly or even derisively, a freshman's introduction to exology. 
But all that numerology was perplexing to me when I first arrived. And who today doesn't understand the verb to major? But I recall reading an American campus novel and getting a little fed up with all the twittering of sophomores and juniors and seniors when, like a breath of fresh air, an English major came into the room. Aha, I thought. <laughs> My mind immediately filled with visions of riding breeches and moustaches, a real character at last. <laughs> I'm going to end on a sad note, but it's one that means a lot to me. Uh, when I was at Oxford, and a graduate student of Nico Tinbergen, as I mentioned before, um, my, in a way my more important mentor was Tinbergen's number two, whose name was Michael Cullen, an unsung hero of the science of ethology. And I would like to read to you part of the eulogy that I composed for his funeral service in the chapel of Wadham College, Oxford. He did not publish many papers himself, yet he worked prodigiously hard, both in teaching and research. He was probably the most sought-after tutor in the entire zoology department. The rest of his time, he was always in a hurry and worked a hugely long day, was devoted to research. But seldom his own research. Everybody who knew him has the same story to tell. All the obituaries told it in revealingly similar terms. You would have a problem with your research. You knew exactly where to go for help, and there he would be for you. I see the scene as yesterday, the lunchtime conversation in the crowded little kitchen, the wiry, boyish figure in the red sweater, slightly hunched like a spring wound up with intense intellectual energy, sometimes rocking back and forth with concentration. The deeply intelligent eyes, understanding what you meant even before the words came out. The back of the envelope to aid explanation. The occasionally sceptical, quizzical tilt of the eyebrows under the untidy hair. Then he would have to rush off. He always rushed everywhere, perhaps for a tutorial. And he would seize his biscuit tin by its wire handles and disappear. But next morning, the answer to your problem would arrive in Mike's small, distinctive handwriting. Two pages, often some algebra, diagrams, a key reference to the literature, sometimes an apt verse of his own composition, or a fragment of Latin or classical Greek, always encouragement. We were grateful, but not grateful enough. If we had thought about it, we would have realised he must have been working on that mathematical model of my research all evening. And it isn't only me for whom he does this. Everybody in the research group gets the same treatment. And not just his own students. I was officially Nico Tinbergen's student, not Mike's. Mike took me on without payment and without official recognition when my research became more mathematical than Nico could handle. When the time came for me to write my thesis, it was Mike Cullen who read it, criticised it, helped me polish every line. And all this while he was doing the same thing for his own official students. When, we all should have wondered, does he get time for ordinary family life? When does he get time for his own research? No wonder he so seldom published anything. No wonder he never wrote his long-awaited book on animal communication. In truth, he should have been joint author of just about every one of the hundreds of papers that came out of that research group during that golden period. In fact, his name appears on virtually none of them, except in the acknowledgments section. The worldly success of scientists is judged, for promotion or honours, by their published papers. Mike did not rate highly on this index, but if he had consented to add his name to his students' publications as readily as modern supervisors insist on putting their names on papers to which they contribute much less, Mike would have been a conventionally successful scientist lauded with conventional honours. As it is, he was a brilliantly successful scientist in a far deeper and truer sense. And I think we know which kind of scientist we really admire. Oxford sadly lost him to Australia. Years later, in Melbourne, at a party for me as visiting lecturer, I was standing, probably rather stiffly, with a drink in my hand. Suddenly, 
The familiar figure shot into the room in a hurry as ever. The rest of us were in suits, but not this familiar figure. The years vanished away. Everything was the same. Though he must have been well into his sixties by then, he seemed still to be in his thirties. The glow of boyish enthusiasm, even the red sweater. Next day he drove me to the coast to see his beloved penguins, stopping on the way to look at giant Australian earthworms, many feet long. We tired the sun with talking, not, I think, about old times and old friends, and certainly not about ambition, grant-getting and papers in nature but about new science and new ideas. It was a perfect day, the last day I saw him. We may know other scientists as intelligent as Mike Cullen, though not many. We may know other scientists who were as generous in support, though vanishingly few. But I declare we have known nobody who had so much to give, combined with so much generosity in giving it. Thank you very much. Any questions? Can we have the lights up so I can see? Thank you. Hello. Can you hear me? Um, so this is a question regarding God and religion and evolution. Okay. Uh, somehow, like the common cold. We have not been able to develop resistance to this crutch called you know, religion and God. So do you think there is somewhat of a benefit um, of having this crutch, of you know, being susceptible to these notions? And is there any hope? Well, um, my website sells a t-shirt which says, religion, together we can find the cure. Uh, I think it is a bit like a virus, actually, and um, that may be the key to understanding where it comes from. I don't think that there actually is a Darwinian benefit to religion per se. I do think that there's a Darwinian benefit to various psychological predispositions which manifest themselves as religion under the right cultural conditions. And one of these predispositions I've suggested is a tendency to obey orders, or more specifically, a tendency for the child brain to believe what its parents tell it. I think it's easy to see that natural selection in a wild state, in a, in a wild animal, our ancestors in Africa that were living a life fraught with danger. There was danger from large carnivores, there was danger from snakes, scorpions, uh, precipices, cliff edges, and so on, crocodiles. And so for a child to survive, it probably would have been a good thing to have been equipped genetically with a rule of thumb in the brain that said, whatever your parents tell you, do it. Don't ask questions. Don't be scientific and skeptical. Just do what your parents say. If they say, don't pick up a snake, obey them. If they say, don't bathe in the river because of the crocodiles, obey them. So the child brain then, would, would be genetically pre-programmed, pre-adapted to believe whatever its parents told it. A bit like a computer, which is uh, built by engineers so that it will obey implicitly whatever you tell it to in its machine code. That obviously includes useful programs, which is mostly what it does, but it also includes computer viruses if anybody is malevolent enough to wish to write one. Uh, and as far as the computer is concerned, it obviously doesn't know which instructions are good and useful instructions like Microsoft Office and which ones are malevolent instructions like um, pass on this virus and while you're about it, erase this entire hard disk. Um, it's just so the child brain comes into the world with a rule of thumb believe everything your parents tell you, and that includes useful information, like don't go bathing in the river Limpopo, because there are crocodiles there. But it also is vulnerable to useless and even uh, time-wasting or even malevolent information, like it's necessary to spend hours every day on your knees 
uh, praying to the east, or it's necessary to sacrifice a goat at the time of the full moon, or whatever it might be. The child brain has no way of distinguishing the useful information from the useless information. And so any traditional information that happens to spring up, like you have to pray to the full moon or what, whatever, um, is going to get passed on just like a computer virus. And so my suggestion would be that uh, traditional religious beliefs uh, are like computer viruses. They're a kind of mind virus. Um, and um, maybe that answers your question. I'm not sure whether it does. Uh, Professor Dawkins, you were uh, a refreshingly outspoken critic of Pope Benedict, uh, Joseph Ratzinger. Um, I, I suppose I, what criticisms do you have for the new pope in light of his recent interviews and uh, speeches in which he reached out to atheists and other, others of non-Catholic faith? Yes, I don't know what to make of it, really. I, I, I mean, part of me fears that we've moved from a wolf in wolf's clothing to a, a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Um, uh, he does seem to have, in spite of his nice words, um, his honeyed words, he does seem to have the same um, uh, beliefs about things that really matter, like, like contraception and, and, and so on. Um, so um, I think we need to bide our time and see whether he, whether he really is... Um, as, as, as benevolent as he, as he seems to be. I guess I'm next. Thanks for coming today, Clinton. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I was, at one point, I was somewhat interested in uh, joining the Masons just from a social standpoint. And I looked at their rules. And one of the rules was you had to believe in something. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on the idea that regardless of what religion you are, you're okay with somebody if they believe in something. Doesn't matter how crazy it is. It could be, well, to name one, Scientology or something like that. But as long as it's a religion, it's okay versus nothing. I, I don't understand why that is. So well, can you can you believe in um, the scientific method, for example? Um, would that would that count? Um, can you believe um, that? Uh, yes, I mean that that seems to me to be. Uh, something to believe in um, because it works. I mean, there's evidence for it. It's hard to imagine not believing in anything um, uh, unless you use the word belief in a funny way. Uh, I should have thought believing in reality, believing that there's a real world, believing that you can investigate the real world by observation and experiment, um, I, would, I think I would probably wish to call that belief. Well, specifically, they said a higher power, which... Oh, a higher power, I beg your pardon. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I, um, uh, I don't have any hankering after any sort of higher power. I'm not even sure what a higher power would look like. Um, a higher power meaning something that we don't yet understand that I could easily believe it. I mean, I'm quite sure it's, it's highly likely that on other planets in the universe there are other life forms, and some of them may very well have developed a technology so far in advance of us that we, if we ever met them, might feel inclined to bow down and worship them in the same kind of way as uh, if we were to visit the Middle Ages in a Boeing 747 and display a laptop computer, uh, we would probably be worshipped as gods. Um, as Arthur C. Clarke said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So I think you might well wish to use the word higher power for an alien intelligence that was superhuman, but not supernatural. I can't actually quite imagine what supernatural would look like. Um, so no, I, don't, I wouldn't wish to join any organization that required me to believe in anything supernatural. I trust you didn't actually join the Masons. No, no thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, perhaps I'll follow up on the, this question, because 
Um, this is a matter uh, that has had some, some local relevance. There seem to be a, a large number of people who claim to be religious but very tolerant, but they seem to be tolerant of other religions but very intolerant to atheists. There seems to be a, a strong sense in which atheists are somehow, the, the, even the, the existence is offensive to them. Uh, one such person is, is a recent uh, executive of King County, the county in which we, we live, who, who you know, made it very clear that he accepted people of all faiths as long as you had faith. Yes. Um, and I wonder if you have some explanation for why there is it, this, this it, scene. It is bizarre, isn't it? I mean, it's a thing you very often meet um, until, I think, very, very recently, the Boy Scouts required you to believe in some sort of higher it's, power. Still, still I um, and, um, and Little League here. Yes. And um, <laughs> to get charitable recognition, to get, to get charitable status, both in Britain and... Uh, um, in America to get the tax-free sta status of a, of, of a charity. You can do it if you're not religious, but it's a hell of a lot easier if you're religious. It doesn't matter what religion you are. Oddly enough, in Britain, there was a time when it had to be a monotheistic religion. But I think the Hindus protested and got, and, and, and got that, that changed. Um, but it's still, it's pretty difficult if you, if you don't have some sort of religion. I have two charities which I founded, uh, both called the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, one in Britain, one in America. And the British Charity Commissioners, this is the organization that decides whether you get tax-free charitable status, at one point wrote to me and said, please explain, uh, it was called the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, and they said, please explain how science benefits humanity. <laughs> But if it had been a religion, it would have sailed through. And by the way, I, I spent some time in Washington, uh, D.C., a, a couple of weeks ago, talking to about a, a half a dozen Congress people, and they all told me the same thing, which is that you can get tax-free charitable status in America if you call yourself reverend, but there is no policing to see whether you have any legitimate theological qualifications. So I would invite everybody in this room to declare themselves reverend and get tax-free status and break the system. First of all, thank you for your relentless push for reason. Um, my question is about it's kind of usual to hear these days people claiming that I'm not religious, uh, but I'm, um, sorry, we're just, I'm spiritual, thank you. Um, so what's your take on this kind of claim of being spiritual? Is that sort of a good compromise, a better option for people, or is that the step in, on the slippery slope of defying right. reason? Right. I, I think that it can be a, a semantic matter. I think that um, quite a lot of scientists especially who claim to be religious or others claim that they are religious if you actually cross question them to see what they believe it usually turns out to be something which you you might be calling spiritual um, einstein for example uh, used the language of religion a lot einstein was always talking about god he said things like what i really want to know is whether god had any choice in creating the universe what he meant by that was, is there only one way for a universe to be? But he put it in God language. Um, and he made various other, he said, I'm a deeply religious non-believer. Um, Carl Sagan used the poetic language of um, science. He would describe the, the, the poetic feelings that he had when contemplating the universe. I feel the same way when contemplating the universe or when contemplating deep time, geological time, when contemplating the complexity of life, the evolution of life. You can use the word spiritual for this feeling of reverence almost, reverence for the deep mysteries of the universe and science. Um, but don't use it to mean anything supernatural. It's, it's used for reverence for that which we don't yet understand. I think that's perhaps the way Einstein was using it. There's a lot that we don't understand. There are deep problems in the universe that still require solution. 
and we can feel spiritual about it, we can feel um, almost tearful about it sometimes, and I think I do that. But I prefer not to use the word spiritual because, as you said, there is a slippery slope and people may sometimes mistake what you're saying for religion in the sense of a personal God, which Einstein himself disavowed most vigorously. Thank you. So, following up on your inquiry from the British authorities about how science benefits humanity, how did you respond? I'm afraid I had to take it straight. I mean, I, I'm afraid... I, where, sorry, where are you? I, I don't know who I'm talking to yet. I'm afraid I had to... Um, I mean, I asked the lawyer who was dealing with my case, I said, surely I don't have to answer this, do I? And she said, yes, I'm afraid you do. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I gave the sort of conventional spie spiel on, on um, how important science is for practical um, uses for humanity. But I'm sure that I would have added, because I feel strongly about it, that it's not just the practical uses of science that are important, but it's also really sim similar to what I was just saying about the, the spirituality. I mean, the, um, the, the poetic feelings that, that we have when we contemplate uh, the world as seen through the eyes of science. Um, I think you could make a nice analogy uh, between, um, well, what, what one way of putting it is to talk about uh, the, the space exploration. And you can talk in sort of Arthur C. Clarke or Carl Sagan type terms about the outward urge and the, the urge to explore and the spirit of Columbus and Magellan and, and, and uh, Drake and people like that who felt the urge to explore. That we feel about space. That would be one motive for going into space. The other motive would be the practical one, a byproduct, a spin-off from the space race was the non-stick frying pan. But we don't justify the space race because the spin-off was the non-stick frying pan. Nor do we justify music because it's good exercise for the violinist's right arm. It's, there's something more to music, there's something more to science than that. And I hope that I, that I conveyed that to this Philistine in the British um, <laughs> Charities Office. Thank you. Two questions. One, do you believe in luck? Second question is, why not be agnostic rather than an atheist? Do I believe in luck? Well, um, I read the bit about if the second dinosaur to the left of the tall cycad tree hadn't happened to sneeze. We are all gigantically lucky to be here. Um, the, the luck that a particular sperm happened to hit a particular egg in your parents' generation and your grandparents' generation and your great-grandparents' generation is simply stupendous. We, we none of us have any right to be here. Yet with hindsight, here we are. So yes, I believe in luck, but I don't believe that, that you can do it with foresight. I think with hindsight we're lucky, but I don't believe that you can say some people are luckier than others when they play roulette or something like that. If the roulette wheel is fair, then uh, it's, it's random and, and you can't say that some people are luckier than others. Um, in my previous book, The Magic of Reality, uh, which is a children's book, I dealt with this question by pointing out that I, I used the, the example of, uh, of, 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 of cricket. Perhaps you play cricket, so I, I don't know, sir. Um, and um, you know that it, when, when you're about to start a cricket match, um, the two captains toss for who's going to bat first, and it's a it's great advantage to win the toss. And there are some people who believe that some individuals are better at winning the toss, and so they might even choose them to be captain of their team because they're more likely to win the toss. And I use the example of um, an Indian captain, Dhoni, um, who, uh, w who won the toss, I think, seven times in a row, and people started to believe that, um, that he was more likely to win the toss again because of that. Other people might actually use the exact opposite fallacy and say, well, he's won the toss so many times, it's somebody else's turn now. <laughs> Both, of course, are fallacious. Um, and, uh, that, uh, but a lot of people believe, a lot of, a lot of gamblers in particular, believe in this particular fallacy. About, about luck, but luck, luck with hindsight, yes, by all means talk about luck with hindsight. We are all, with hindsight, immensely lucky to be alive 
And that's a very good reason for not wasting our time while we're here. Oh, the other question was, why not be agnostic? Yes, we're all agnostic, really, about millions and millions of things. We're agnostic about Thor and Wotan and Apollo and Zeus and Wonder Woman and um, <laughs> Superman and um, uh, leprechauns, uh, flying teapots. We, um, the, you know, Bertrand Russell's analogy of the teapot in, in, in space, you can't disprove it. So technically, we're, we're agnostic about the teapot, but in practice, we're a teapotists. <laughs> we, we, don't, we don't consider our agnosticism, we don't push our agnosticism to the point of actually seriously um, worshipping the teapot or anything like that. Although, having said that, uh, I was once sent a picture that I think came from Malaysia of a gigantic teapot. It was a temple in the shape of a teapot and people were worshipping the teapot. And so uh, I had to be a little bit careful when I used Bertrand Russell's teapot. <laughs> So uh, this is, uh, could you tell us a little bit of how uh, computer science is perceived among biologists? I mean, this is in relation to the, uh, where the talk was introduced. Well, w when I said that at the beginning uh, about computer science being relevant to, to biology, I mean, of course it's relevant in the sense that we use computers all the time. But that wasn't actually what I meant. I mean, all scientists use computers all the time nowadays. That wasn't what I meant. What I meant was that since the Watson and Crick revolution in molecular biology, which began in 1953 and has been gathering pace ever since, we've recognized that genetics and the basis for life itself, the machine code of life, it is just like man-made computers. It's not binary, it's quaternary. But apart from that, bio modern biology is a branch of computer science, a branch of information technology. The way genes work and the way genes are, they're just like long, long reels of computer tape. Uh, and um, you can use all the same kinds of, of um, jargon that you use as, as computer scientists. And with hindsight, I think it's arguable that Darwinian evolution would not have been possible in any other way. Because for Darwinian evolution to work, you need to have very high fidelity data processing. There must be, there must be a, just a few mistakes, but not many mistakes. Very, very few mistakes. The sorts of um, low-level errors that, that, we, that you try to get rid of in computer science and never, can, never quite get rid of them. Um, so that, that's what I meant by saying that, that biology is a branch of, of computer science, but in a more mundane, practical sense, we use computers all the time for processing data, for running simulations, which is a very important aspect of biological research, and, and so on. Um, Professor uh, Dawkins, uh, as, a, as a parent, I aspire to instill in my children um, the love of free thinking and, and, and critical thinking. Um, at the same time, coming from a family where there are deeply religious uh, people there, I really want to avoid their minds to become a battlefield of, of sorts and, and, and them ended up being the victims. Uh, do you have any words of advice how to thread in that kind of Yes. Um, I, I think the thing to do is... is um, don't indoctrinate them in atheism any more than you would indoctrinate them in religion, but encourage them to think critically. And of course, you have to tailor that to the age when they're very young. It's, it's different from when they're, when they're a bit older. So um, I think in particular, children um, should not be... We should, we should give up the assumption that so many of, uh, of us in our society do have that children automatically are assumed to be of the same religion as their parents. That I, that, I think, is, is wicked. Uh, and um, if you, I mean, you, you can raise consciousness in people about that so that they should never actually talk about a Catholic child or an Anglican child or a Muslim child. You raise consciousness of that by putting to them the possibility of talking about 
an existentialist child, or a postmodernist child, or a logical positivist child. You'd never dream of doing that, or a Keynesian child, or a monetarist child. You'd never dream of doing that. And yet, uh, so many people in our society are perfectly happy to talk about a Muslim child or a Catholic child. It is uh, as absurd to talk about a Catholic child or a Muslim child as it is to talk about an, an existentialist child or a Kantian child. Um, and once you get that, once you, once you see the absurdity of that, then you, you never do it again. And you pull people up and stop them. If, they, if you ever hear anybody talking about a Catholic child or a Muslim child or a Protestant child, um, so never label a child with the religion of its parents until the child is old enough to decide for itself. Teach children that religion exists. Teach children about the different religions, because that's an important part of the world in which we live. And you can't understand history without knowing about the different religions, because uh, so many of the wars of history, for example, have been fought over religion. You need to teach children the Bible, because, the, because especially the King James Version of the Bible has fed into so much of English literature, and you can't take your allusions in literature unless you're familiar with biblical phrases. In, in my book, The God Delusion, I had, I think, two whole pages of densely packed print um, of well-known sayings and phrases which most people don't even realize come from the Bible and, and how familiar they are. So I think it's important to teach children about religion, but don't ever indoctrinate your children in religion, nor, nor indoctrinate them in atheism. In, instead, teach them critical thinking so they can make up their own mind when they're old enough to do so. Um, hi, so, uh, so all the uh, research in artificial intelligence like self-driving cars or uh, you know, chess playing machines, has it influenced basic biology in any way? Yes. Um, artificial intelligence is, I think, a very interesting subject. It, it seems to not have um, lived up to the promise of a few decades ago when I think people thought that by the year, by now, 2013, um, we would have artificial intelligence which, which really um, would pass the Turing test and uh, would be, um, we, we might actually be facing the, the need to ask moral questions. Is it, is it immoral to, to, um, to make a, 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 a computer unhappy or something of that sort? We, we seem to be nowhere near that at the moment. Um, I think as a biologist, as a mechanist biologist, I'm committed to the view that there's nothing in the brain which could not, in principle, be simulated in silicon. Uh, because I don't think there are any spooks in the world. I mean, I think it's all material. And so whatever, however the brain works, however the trillions of neurons in the brain actually work, um, in principle, it should be possible to make a computer version of that which would have the same properties. Um, so I think it's of great philosophical interest to to biologists. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Dawkins, uh, and welcome. Uh, as a typical uh, Chinese student, I had no religion before coming to college, uh, but after reading The Selfish uh, Genie, I developed my religious thoughts, and uh, now I'm a Christian. <laughs> the question is... <laughs> well, you can't win them all. <laughs> So the question is, assume a religion with the bare minimum principles of uh, below. Uh, one, there's a personalized God with a higher power and it dictates human to be morally righteous using parables or metaphors. Two, the God doesn't dictate or explain anything other than moral perspective, say science, history, or chronology. So does this religion still impede science or technology progress or harm the world in any way? Well, I don't really understand why you would feel any need to resort to religion when trying to frame your morals. Um, 
I, if that's what you're suggesting, if you're suggesting that somehow we need religion for uh, a moral compass, um, I'm surprised that somebody of a scientific disposition would, would do that, really. Um, when you look at the... When you look at religions, it doesn't matter which one you take, really, but where I happen to be familiar with the Christian one, which is what you're familiar with, um, and you ask yourself, what would be the sources of morality from the religion? I can think of two. Uh, one would be the scriptures, and I think I'm right in saying that no modern moralist would really wish to take their morals from Christian or Jewish scriptures, from the, from the Bible or, or the Quran, for that matter. Um, to be sure, you can find moral verses, verses in the Bible, perhaps especially in the New Testament, uh, which you would regard as moral by the standards of 2013. But you can find a lot more verses that you would most certainly would not regard as moral by the standards of 2013. So when you cherry pick, when you go through the Bible and you say, yes, we'll have that verse and that verse, but we'll leave out all these horrible verses in Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Numbers and Exodus and Genesis, um, when you pick and choose which verses to accept, like the Sermon on the Mount, by what criterion do you pick and choose them? Well, the answer cannot be by scriptural criteria, so the answer must be by some other criteria, and those other criteria are the ones which we all of us in 2013 accept as decent citizens of 2013 anyway. Now, where those morals come from, I mean, we're all pretty much labelled 2013 moralists. We, but we don't like sexism, we don't like slavery, we don't like racism, we're becoming kinder to non-human animals. There are all sorts of ways in which our morals are labelled 2013. And it's by those 2013 criteria that we decide which verses in the Bible or the Quran to accept and which verses to, to reject. So it doesn't seem to me to make any sense to say that you need religion in order to get, or certainly not that you need scripture in order to, to get your morality. The other possible source of morality might be a more mercenary one of, of wishing to please God and not offend him sucking up to God. Uh, that might be the motivation for some people. I have actually even met people who said, if I didn't believe in God, I'd go out and murder my neighbour. But, but I don't think many of us would wish to know such a person. I think we'd rather prefer to make friends with people whose motive for being good is not that they are sucking up to God or that they are frightened of a sort of divine spy camera in the sky that's watching over everything we do. So I'm somewhat baffled by your um, being persuaded of the need for religion by moral considerations. This will be the last question. Okay. Do you think that human society will ever mature to the point where it doesn't need religion? And whether or no, what do you think is the best way to get us to advance towards that point? I guess you can tell I'm a little biased. <laughs> well, I, obviously I hope so. Um, and I am moderately optimistic. Uh, I think that um, in... Well, there, there's some, some evidence, some statistical evidence that religion tends to die in those parts of the world where there is plenty of social welfare, plenty of provision for people, so they don't have to fear poverty, destitution, ill health, and so on. Uh, the Scandinavian countries, which are the most irreligious countries in the world, are also the countries in the world that have the most um, benevolent social welfare system. Um, the United States is the country in the Western advanced world, which I suppose has the least. Um, it's struggling to get Obamacare through, for example, which would be a pretty tame kind of social welfare by Scandinavian standards. And um, Gregory Paul, whose research I'm citing, uh, 
has looked not only at across different countries, but also at um, the different states within the United States, and finds that the same correlation holds, that those states which are the most religious are also the states which have the least social welfare, and they're also the states that have the highest abortion rates, the highest rates of, of um, uh, single parenthood and, and, and th things like that, that, that there, you might think that religious people would disapprove of. Um, so that, that's possible one, one ground for optimism, that, you, that the, the, the more we move towards a kind of welfare state, um, the, the more religion will die. Um, I think the other grounds for hope come really from the internet, where um, it's very hard for dictatorships to prevent people from getting access to the internet. It's very hard for theocracies like uh, Saudi Arabia to prevent people from getting access to the knowledge of the world uh, because of the internet. They try. Um, Moore's law is seeing to it that access to computers becomes ever cheaper and wider. And so even relatively poor parts of the world are increasingly becoming linked to the internet. And um, so I, I feel rather happy making this point in, in one of the leading um, computer high-tech companies in the, in the world. Um, it seems to me that people like you are, are doing a good thing in, in spreading computers and the internet um, to all parts of the world.